So, so yeah, I am pleased to welcome Greg McRae. He's the founder and CEO at the Foundation Group. And this session is going to be for all of you here who are really looking to start an organization for yourselves. So um, he's going to really lead us through how to start a 501c3 um, from the beginning. So this is perfect if you just wanted to learn from founders in the last session, and now you can be a founder yourself with this session. So thank you so much, Greg, for being here today. And thank you again for being a sponsor. Uh, you're welcome, Candice. Glad to be able to do it. Glad to join everybody. Uh, this is uh, an exciting event that's going on. So we're glad to be super glad to be a part of it. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about Foundation Group, we are a, best way to think about us is we are a tax and compliance firm for charities and nonprofits. So we help new organizations get started. That's a little bit about what we're going to be talking about here in a minute. And we help existing organizations with things like Form 990, charitable solicitations, registration, which I'm going to be talking about later this afternoon, uh, as well as full service bookkeeping. So we're on the tax and accounting and compliance side of things. Uh, so if Candace, are you ready for us to roll? Yeah, you All can right. take it away. And it looks like you have um, a client or two with us today too. So they're excited to hear from you. That's great. I know, hopefully we were able to send some folks to sign up. So I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Can everybody see that? Hopefully everybody can see that. Let's see. Yep, looks great. All right, sorry about that. I'm just making sure I've got my own controls visible here. Here we go. All right. Well, I mean, as you guys, part of the entire part of this process is the reality that you know, we're living in a world that embraces nonprofit solutions. We're talking at this stage 1.425, this is as of 2019, over 1.4 million charities and private foundations. That doesn't include a lot of the other 501c other organizations. Two trillion in economic impact in 2019. That includes money spent in program services as well as just the, the hiring and the, uh, the revenue base as far as employment. Almost 1 billion of that is from employment and 12.3 million people in the workforce employed through a 501c3. It's about 12 to 13% of the entire US workforce. So huge impacts, 100,000 organizations over, over that much got started in 2019. So there's a lot of people looking to do something through a nonprofit solution. As many as 25% of Americans over age 16 uh, are volunteering through a nonprofit organization. And a lot of these are numbers that, that you guys know um, but they don't tell the full story. You know, part of the rest of the story is that less than 50% of nonprofits that get started survive their first five years. And a lot of that just has to do with not knowing all that you're getting into. Uh, you may have a great purpose, a great plan. A lot of times there's a lack of understanding or appreciation for the technical side of it. And, you know, one of the things that happened, and this is since the IRS introduced a, an abbreviated way to get 501c3 status for organizations that are small, under 50,000 per year in revenue, um, Taxpayer Advocates Office did a spot study and found that 40% of nonprofits in their spot study uh, that had gotten 501c3 status from the IRS in the shortcut way actually weren't even properly organized legally. And so lots of issues when it comes to starting it the right way. And since 2011, we've actually had over half a million organizations lose their 501c3 status. This is what happens when an organization doesn't file their annual IRS form 990 for three straight years. So for all the good that's happening in the sector, there's a lot of things that are unfortunate as well. And a lot of that comes just from a lack of knowledge on the front end of how to set these things up correctly so that it avoids a lot of those pitfalls. So the question comes up, if you're starting a new organization, if this is something that you've not done, you've not actually launched your own entity, how do you put the odds on your side and have the impact you desire and avoid some of the headaches uh, that we're talking about? Well, 
a lot of that just comes from understanding what it is that you're doing from a technical standpoint. You know your mission, you know the problem you're trying to solve, but what does it actually mean to create an actual living, breathing, functioning organization? So really quickly, I wanna kind of walk through what this looks like because there's a lot of similarities to a for-profit company. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you really are setting up a business and it's gotta operate a lot like a business in that, for one thing, you're going to need to bring in more revenue than you're spending. But some of the ways that a nonprofit is similar to similar to a for-profit, it's got a business structure of some sort. Uh, all business entities must have a, a formal legal structure of some kind, whether that's a corporation, partnership, LLC, sole proprietorship. In the nonprofit space, that's going to be a corporation most of the time. You have governance. All business entities have somebody or some bodies who are responsible for governing the organization. The buck's got to stop with some someone. That's typically going to be your board of directors in a nonprofit setting. Staff, you may have a paid staff. For profits have paid staff. You may be offering products or services for sale, maybe not for sale. One of the things that a lot of nonprofits that get started, and we we help set up between 800 and 1,000. I will do that many this year. And a lot of the folks that we talk to, they never really think about what they're doing as offering something that's a product or service. But even if you're a grant making organization, you're offering a service. And so there's got to be a plan behind that as far as how that functions. Another similarity to a for-profit company is that a nonprofit is regulated by state and federal law. That's not a great surprise there. And it must account for its finances to the penny. You would be surprised at, at how many people we talk to that think because there's no tax consequence with it being a tax exempt entity, they can be really fuzzy with how the money's accounted for. Well, I think most of us know that that's not, that's not the case. The IRS and your state care quite a bit as to how all of that is accounted for. So those are the similarities. So how are nonprofits significantly different? Well, they are in, in very critical ways and successful operation of a nonprofit requires an understanding of what's required and adherence to best practices. And that's really what I wanna talk about for the remainder of our time is what are these requirements and what are the best practices? One important thing that we talk to with clients is helping them understand really even definitions. And a lot of times we'll see terms like 501c3, nonprofit, tax exempt organization, we'll see those terms used interchangeably. Um, and we'll also see a big misconception about what the word nonprofit even means. Uh, there, there's, a, there's even an, an entrenched mindset within some in the nonprofit community. I, I'm, after 25 years of doing this, I'm still shocked how many times it comes up. But the question of, do we have to zero out at the end of the year? not sure how things like that get entrenched in the nonprofit mindset in some places, but nonprofit really isn't even about cash. Nonprofit is all about the structure and the purpose, not the bottom line. So, you know, it's logical that nonprofits shouldn't have a profit motive, but they should have income that exceeds expenses. Uh, that, that myth of zeroing out on December 31st can have some pretty nasty consequences on January 1st. So it's more about how you're structured what your purpose is and how you're conducting yourself. Another point that is missed on a lot of startup owners or a lot of startup, I'm about to contradict myself. One point that's missed with a lot of startups is the idea that a nonprofit doesn't have any owners. And for a founder, this can be a little unsettling, but in a nonprofit space, there's no mechanism for ownership because the corporation that's being set up has no stock. There's no, there's no method of ownership. You know, if you're looking at an LLC or a partnership, you know, there's a percentage split based on partnership agreement. There's no such thing in the nonprofit space. So really the board of directors, that is who's responsible for not only governing the organization, but they're the ones that they're, that's who the buck stops with. They're the accountable party. Uh, and some for-profits obviously have board of directors as well, though it's not required in a traditional sense, especially the smaller that you are, you may have a couple of officers that don't do much of anything, but in the nonprofit space, your board of directors is huge. 
uh, they have to have, your, your nonprofit has to have one, and they are the ones that have true accountability. Now, you'll see organizations that will call their board trustees, you'll see some religious organizations that may call them elders, but at the end of the day, it's a group of people who are responsible for governing the affairs of the nonprofit. They're responsible for mission, for oversight, for accountability, they approve budgets, they're not management, though there can be overlap. You can have members of the board who are also part of your management and operations team, but management is accountable to the board. The, board's, the, the board really is where the buck stops. Another attribute of a nonprofit is that it's going to exist for a charitable or other non-commercial purpose. I think a lot of times in the nonprofit space, because the whole 501c universe is dominated by 501c3s, we kind of think that that's all there is, but there are a huge number of other types of 501c organizations that are not charitable, but they have a non-commercial purpose. Um, they can be anywhere from chambers of commerce, social clubs, co-ops, things like that. So let's shift gears a little bit because a lot of what you're wanting to know about is going to be what are the technical steps of starting a nonprofit. And so that's really kind of an overview of what a nonprofit is. So let's, like, let's take a look at what it actually takes to get one up and running. There are four primary technical steps, and that's going to be organization, incorporation, IRS 501c3 status, and then one that usually gets left off the list, charitable solicitation registration. We're not going to talk about that in this session. I've got another session this afternoon that's exclusively about that. So hopefully you'll be able to, to, start to come back to that this afternoon, and we'll talk about that some more. But I really want to hone in on this idea of organization, because I think this is where a lot of startups miss it. A lot of startups think, well, there's really two steps to this. I need to get incorporated and I need to get 501c3 status. And they really skip what I think is the most important first step. And that is the organizational step. And it, it involves a number of things. And research is what I consider to be one of the most important things. Number one, evaluate need. What is the need or problem that your organization is designed to solve? That's a big deal. And I think conceptually, a lot of people know what that is, but maybe they haven't actually fleshed it out and spent the time to, to draft out verbally, maybe, maybe hopefully in writing what it is, what is the need that we're trying to solve. Another thing is evaluating feasibility. Before you launch something, you need to kind of think through the idea of can your solution work? Do you have the resources necessary to make it happen? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. We see way too many situations where people get started on the technical steps and they really haven't fleshed through a lot of this. Another thing that's part of the research step is evaluating sustainability. Are you going to be able to establish a sufficient income stream to keep this thing going? Uh, are grants in your picture? Is it going to be primarily donation? Are you going to be selling uh, something that's going to generate revenue or some other type of sustainability? Understanding how your organization is going to be able to make it economically is a big part of the initial step before you ever file the first piece of paper with a government agency. Another part of the organizational step is a three year plan of action. We really hammer on this with our clients and it's a very underappreciated discipline. A three year plan is going to help you visualize long term, not just the immediate 90 days. It's going to help you when applying for 501c3 status as well whether you're doing it yourself or using an organization like us, having a sketched out plan, even if you're relaying it to somebody like us verbally, already having that sketched out takes a lot of the, the pain out of that process. And it doesn't have to be formal. We've seen well thought out plans that were sketched out on, the, on a sheet of, one sheet of legal paper, but it's the idea that you've actually spent time and put to paper what this thing is going to look like. At this point, you still haven't filed any paperwork, but hopefully you are recruiting your initial board members. And there's no magic number. It can be as few as three. It can be as many as you need. Uh, it's always helpful to have exactly as many as you need and no more. You, you don't want more voices than can actually contribute to the success of the organization. But a lot of times you're going to want more than maybe three so that you do have sufficient diversity of opinion and background and and life experience and everything else. But choose wisely. 
uh, you know, the board, I, I kind of harped on this a little bit earlier, your board, the buck stops with them. So you need to make sure that you're choosing people who identify with your mission. They are willing to contribute time, talent, and treasure. You do not want placeholders on your board. Uh, and you do need a majority of your board members to be unrelated by blood, marriage, or outside business ownership. Uh, they need to be a majority independent uh, and a majority uncompensated if it's going to be a charity that you're starting. So step two is incorporation. This is where it gets real. You're creating a legal entity that exists apart from the people forming it. And it's the core entity that everything else is attached to. And one thing that gets confusing for some is that you only incorporate in one state. You may operate nationally, but you're only gonna be incorporated in one state. You can have multi-state operations. You may be a California corporation that does work in Arizona, but you can't be incorporated in both places. And you should choose a corporate structure. The other choices are severely limited. LLCs and partnerships typically don't work. There is a way to do LLCs, but it requires all of the parties to already be existing other organizations, not individuals. So I won't go into that, but over 95% of nonprofits are corporations. There's a select few that are trusts or un unincorporated associations. Those are a lot more difficult to deal with. Corporate status is usually the best way to go. And it's almost always best to incorporate in your state of operations. So we get the question a lot of times, uh, where should we incorporate? Well, there's virtually no exception because of the way the nonprofit rules work federally and even interstate that this notion of incorporating in Delaware, this comes up a lot. Uh, it, there's no advantage to nonprofits unless you're located there. The privacy rules for corporations that exist in Delaware just doesn't translate to nonprofits. There's, there's transparency requirements that are just in place for nonprofits. So, and it also doesn't really home state compliance requirements to be incorporated there. So watch out for companies that promote the idea of nonprofits incorporating in Delaware. That's kind of a red herring. Now we come to 501c3 status. This is really what everybody's after. And all 501c3 statuses, we talked about how the terms are not interchangeable, but 501c3 is just a tax status that is attached to your nonprofit corporation. And if you're going to be a 501c3, it's either going to be as a public charity, a private foundation, or a private operating foundation. Most are going to be public charities. And once the IRS reviews your Form 1023 application, that's when they grant status. So let's, let's kind of look real quickly at, at what is this Form 1023. It's really the equivalent of a business plan. And this is where that three-year plan comes into play. The filing package is going to be anywhere from 40 to 100 pages if you're an organization with greater than $50,000 annual budget. And it's gonna have dozens of yes, no, explain type questions, listing of board members and relations between them, uh, questions involving conflict of interest. There's a lots of sub schedules with more questions depending on your particular programs. There's a lot to it. It also includes a three-year budget or prior year financials if, you, if you've actually started operating. IRS wants to know how you're gonna get your money, how you're gonna spend it. What are the sources going to be? Donations, fundraisers, product and service sales. What are your expense categories going to be? Uh, they want to know any prior year financial activity. And they also want to know what you're going to be doing. This is the written narrative part of the Form 1023. It's one of the things that our staff really excels on. And this is where your story is told. This is the who, what, when, where, how, and why of what you're doing. And you're making the case to the IRS that the purpose and programs satisfy a qualifying exempt purpose. And this is where, uh, this is where making sure uh, you're putting it together the right way eliminates as many possible questions. So the IRS is gonna be looking for qualifying purpose, a qualifying program. They're gonna be looking for that proper organizational structure with your board of directors. They're gonna be looking to see if enough of your revenue coming in is from the general public. You need at least a third of your revenue coming in from people who are giving less than 2% of the total. So you, you can't exist solely on large grants or large donors. You do need to build a base of support. And you're hearing a lot about that uh, over the last, last few days here. Finally, hopefully at the end of the, the situation here, you're getting a letter of determination from the IRS. And if they approve you, in most cases, they're gonna backdate that to when you incorporate it. And so that's a, that's a great thing. We've, we've helped over 20,000 organizations do this. Getting your approval, 
depends on the IRS backlog. Right now we're seeing organizations take anywhere from 90 days to as much as six months uh, to get actually approved by the IRS. The timeline's got a lot to do with the complexity of your programs, quality of the application going in, uh, but right now it's about three to six months. So really quickly, in the couple of minutes that I've got left, I wanna talk about some do's and don'ts of what makes an organization successful once it's set up. Some of the things you don't wanna do, avoid conflict of interest if you can, certainly avoid anything that's going to unfairly result in benefit to an insider. That's a big thing the IRS harps on and a big thing to avoid. Watch out for commercially equivalent activity. If you look like a for-profit business, the IRS may consider that you are. Look out for founder syndrome. Founders that end up being uh, mini dictators, that is a, a bad situation. Non-compliance, get it right the first time. It's a whole lot less painful and less expensive than trying to clean up a mess. Uh, some of the things you wanna do, always be about your charitable purpose. Don't forget what that is. Watch out for mission creep. Always strive for transparency of operations that's required legally. And it also just makes you look better to funders and supporters. Transparency in your finances and communicate with your community and your donor base. That is just absolutely key. Maintain best practice. We're here to help for organizations that need that. Know what you can do legally. And I know I'm flying through these, but our, but our time is short. Um, make sure your books and records are current and accurate. That's not, that's not, a, that's not an optional thing. Uh, stay current with your filings and know how to get help if you need help. We've done this for, for organizations for over 25 years. We have a very easy website to find, uh, www.501c3.org. So we are happy to help uh, with anybody that needs help with formation or compliance services. So I awesome. think I'm no longer sharing here. So that was that was a lot to cram in there, but hopefully that uh, that helped you guys. And I know that the session will be available later. So Candace, absolutely. Thank you so much, Greg. This was really insightful and so important to like the core of like you know even like what a nonprofit is. So it's been really super insightful. Um, I saw a couple of people asking for the slides. Um, I think you've shared them with me. Is it okay if I share them in the follow-up email? I, I, they have been edited, so I'll send you a new copy. Okay, perfect. So I'll include that. Um, so for those who are interested in seeing all of this important info later, we'll get those out to you um, tomorrow. So awesome. We do have a few questions here. The next session is at 1045. So um, we'll try to get to a couple of questions. Um, so have you ever encouraged prospective clients to seek fiscal sponsorship under an established C3 instead of starting their own? Absolutely. That is a great option. And we are actually in the process of setting up a fiscal sponsorship agency ourselves. Okay. We have so many people. We have, we have nearly a thousand people a month reach out to us about setting up a nonprofit. And for a lot of them, they're really not ready for that complication and would be better off in a fiscal sponsorship because of the size of their project. So we do recommend that. And it is actually something that we're looking at doing. Awesome, thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee wrote in, what's the best way to let donors know that you have applied for your 501c3, but don't have a determination yet? Can you still receive donations without this? Probably not. Uh, you can receive the donation. You would have to be very transparent upfront that you don't have 501c3 status. So their gift is not tax deductible until the status comes in. The status come, when it comes in, it's typically gonna be retroactive back to formation. So to incorporation process. So more than likely that gift will be covered, but they do need to be transparent. I highly recommend the person that asked that question to come to our charitable solicitation registration session in this afternoon because in most cases, an organization needs to be very careful about soliciting prior to getting IRS determination. Most states do not allow that. Gotcha. Yeah, and then there's another question, uh, another question about just charity compliance, um, saying it's expensive and they don't have the time and skills to register in all states. Also highly recommend you check out the session later today because um, that's gonna go over all of those details. So. 
Um, if you are interested in getting help with starting your 501c3 um, or need help with those forms um, or 990 forms and all of the above, um, the foundation group is an amazing resource. Um, I have so many people in the chat are even saying how awesome your services are and how much it's helped them. Um, I know myself, I uh, a few years back um, went through you for starting my own little nonprofit. And so I can um, say for myself how helpful their services are, especially for the small nonprofit or nonprofit founders that don't have a lot of time and skills to work through all of this. And so the foundation group is an absolutely incredible resource. Um, yeah, and I'll just, uh, yeah, let you, um, do you wanna work through a couple of other questions while I queue up the next speaker? Sure. Um, there's a couple more here. Um, just one that's just defining what fiscal sponsorship is. Yeah, that's a situation where somebody wants to set up maybe a community project, but they don't want to go through the formality of setting up their own 501c3. They can come up under an existing 501c3 that's willing to take accountability for their actions and actually run their donations through that existing 501c3. There's different models of how the money flow works. Uh, there's ways that work better than others. Uh, but usually that's an application process. Someone will go to a fiscal sponsor, apply to be covered under them. But in order to do it legally, the project that's getting started still got to operate according to charitable purposes and avoiding conflict of interest and things like that. But it does avoid having your own board of directors, your own tax status and all of that. So there's there's pros and cons to it. The bigger the operation gets, the least likely that fiscal sponsorship is what you want to do. But for micro charities and temporary projects, sometimes it can be a good option. Okay, great. Um, and then Mike had a message earlier asking, please explain what mission creep is. I think you mentioned that earlier. So what we call mission creep is where you got started to do one thing. And then over the years, you just start morphing into something else. Sometimes that can be organic and necessary. Sometimes the need that you got started for changes, or maybe you've accomplished a lot about a lot of what you set out to do. And so you don't want to disband, you want to do other things. And so maybe, so maybe the creep is organic, but a lot of times it can be, we get distracted by shiny objects and we take our eye off what we really started to do and we start getting what we call a mile wide and an inch deep. You're doing 50 things instead of two things and you're not doing any of them particularly well. And you kind of took your eye off that original goal. So, um, you know, mission creep can be a bad thing. It can be a necessary thing. It's just identifying how are we evolving over time and is that really what we need to be doing? Yeah, absolutely. All right, I know there's so many great questions in the Q&A pane. Um, for those who still have more questions and want to reach out to you, how do you suggest they do that? They can uh, reach out to obviously our website at 501c3.org. Mm -hmm. uh, I can actually, if you go to the teams, the, uh, the team members page on our website, my email address is one of the only ones listed there. I do list my personal email address. So if anybody wants to shoot a question that way, I would be happy to entertain that as well. Awesome. Yeah, there's so many great people. I think there's a lot of people here that will want to um, definitely follow up with you for their questions and inquire about your services. So I think, um, yeah, I just posted your email in the chat and we have the uh, URL to your website. And um, yes, thank you again for what a what a great start um, to um, we're be towards the beginning of today and then we're going to hear from you later. So this is um, so fantastic. Thank you for sharing all of these amazing insights. Glad to. Thanks, Candace. All right. Take care.